Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here with the unity of the Hopewell Presbyterian Church. Um, I'm very happy to have Maria back at the piano. <laughs> and um, I understand she was here yesterday for a service that was very well attended to send off one of the saints of the church to glory. So um, we're happy to have her and um, to be together today. Are there any uh, announcements? Lisa King emailed me this morning. She's not able to be here. She's been sick all week, so we'll remember her later. Um, today is Lily's 10th birthday. So, um, but she sent me information on a number of programs that are happening um, in manicating that she wanted folks to be aware of in case you were interested. There's a butterfly thing. There's a finding frogs thing. There's a brain and balance program. And there is a native plant sale. So if anybody's interested in critters or plants or exercise, come and see me after worship. I have lots more information. Let's take a, a moment of quiet to gather our spirits together in an attitude of worship. Please join me now in the responsive call to worship printed in your bulletin. We come to this place of prayer. For here we can bring our hopes and dreams, our hidden fears, and the doubts we dare to wear on our sleeves. We come to this place of grace. For here we learn compassion and joy and discover how deeply we are loved. We come with these people called the church to be blessed by the variety of gifts, to live as one for our God. Please stand as you are able for our opening hymn number 122, Thine is the glory, risen conquering sun.
God loves us. God lo wants to forgive us. God does forgive us. But it's better for us if we confess what we need to have forgiven. So please let's join together now in the unison prayer of confession. God of glory, we are so busy watching the skies for signs of your presence that we forget to look around to see those we can serve in your name. We are so intent on finding just the right way to tell someone off that we forget the words of reconciliation you have taught to us. We are so convinced we can figure out your schedule that we forget to open ourselves to the presence of your Spirit within us. Mighty source of our lives, forgive us for all that we have done to others. Fill us with the wisdom to resist evil in our lives and strengthen us in that faith which is given to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Hear now this, these words of assurance and join me in the responsive. In the beginning was God, and at the end will be God. And in every moment in between there is God, creating, redeeming, and sustaining us. Through Christ, gracious love is poured into our empty souls. Through the spirit of peace, we come to give that we can share with those around us. Thanks be to God. Amen. us, God forgives us, through God's love and grace we are offered peace for our souls. Please let us now share the peace of Christ with one another, the peace of the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Please join me in the unison prayer for illumination printed in your bulletin. Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears. Penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can. We pray that you will. And we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Our first reading is from the letter to the church at Ephesus, chapter 1. 1 verses 15 through 23. Um, and Paul writes, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation 
as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he, he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Our second reading is from the opening um, of the book of Acts, which as you know is sort of a continuation from the book, the Gospel according to Luke, written um, by the same author. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set up by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were wa watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will in the same way, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. So some of you know from chatting over coffee um, at various times that I was a military brat. Moved around a lot, uh, went to a lot of different schools, lived in a lot of different places. And when this happens, it's, it's a mixture of emotions and feelings. Um, when you have to pack up and go, and it's harder as you get older, middle school, high school, you're losing um, everything that's familiar. You, you have to go to a whole new place you don't know anything about. And there is a certain amount of preparation, packing and traveling and so forth, but that doesn't really tell you what's going to happen next. From the time we knew we were leaving to the time we got to the new place and settled in was this very long emotional transition. Everything old and familiar would be far away, and everything where we were going would be new and unfamiliar. It, it could be scary, but it was also a bit exciting. Um, you know, we had some some anticipation that was that was went both ways and so the question that always came was what now what will it be like 
this new place we're going to. And that kind of experience, those mixed feelings, can happen to people who never move a block away, right? <laughs> Most people who've lived in the same town long enough realize one day it's not the same place it was when they were a kid or a young adult or whatever time they look back to. Our country is not the same, the world is not the same, this community is not the same, this church is not the same. Things may feel new and strange and different, and maybe it's actually been happening for a long time, but the realization can come suddenly. The Ascension story is like that in the life of the church and the earliest disciples. Jesus says he's leaving them. So it's a time of loss. There's a faint flavor of Good Friday. There's grief coming in the coming, grief at the coming change. But at the same time, Jesus says, someone else will come in his place, the Holy Spirit. The disciples of his time and towns, or churches in our time, go through a waiting period that's sort of like Advent right here. What's coming? What's going to happen to us? Who or what is this Holy Spirit Jesus is talking about? Will it be strange? Will it be familiar? It's a time of transition these Sundays between the first Sunday of Easter, Easter Sunday, and Pentecost. Something has ended and something is about to begin, but it's not here yet. So what now? What now? There's some lessons maybe we can take from the Ascension story because that's what's happening with the disciples there. It's not actually triumphalist, although people tend to often read it that way. Um, and by the way, just, this is a symbolic story, right? A lot of symbolism in the Bible. This is not a beam me up Scotty scene here. It's much more complicated. It's theological. It's, it's um, unfortunately, sort of more adult. <laughs> so it's, it's not easy to hear what Jesus has to say. Jesus has been teaching the disciples for 40 days, and those of you probably heard before, 40 is sort of a symbolic number in scripture, right? It rained, right, for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was in the wilderness for uh, 40 days. 40 means enough time, the right amount of time. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean 40 days as we would count them. But why should Jesus have had to do this for 40 days with these people after his whole ministry, his death, his resurrection, and everything they've seen and, and in him and been through with him. Because even so, at the end of this teaching time, they still don't quite get it. They ask, will you restore the kingdom? They're still thinking of a military and political messiah. Surely, a Lord who can rise from the dead is strong enough to conquer the Romans and establish his own kingdom, right? They're asking, you know, what now? But they have specific ideas of what should happen next, how that question should be answered. They have a specific idea that they can't seem to let go of. Why is it so hard to hear what Jesus has to say about the kingdom of God? I think one thing that blocks our hearing is that just like those early disciples, we keep confusing our agendas, personal and national, with God's agenda. Maybe our agenda includes how to fill the pews to overflowing with two dozen kids for the children's sermon, the way it used to be, no matter how unlikely that is, given the changes in our culture and our community. 
Maybe our agenda as a nation is to try to find 100% perfect security through military might, no matter how impossible that is. This story is a reminder to us that we have to keep listening for what God has to say. Listening with an open mind and an open heart and an open spirit to hear God's agenda. It's also a reassurance. We aren't the first and probably not even the worst to fail in this. You know, look at those first disciples. Look what they were asking him, even at this point. But then look at everything that they did afterwards. Look how they spread the word. So we know from looking at them that it's worth, it's worth it to keep going, to keep trying, to persist. Another lesson is this. When changing times challenge our present lives as individuals or churches or communities or nations, we often tend to stand there during the transition, here in the transition. Position. Looking back at what's already gone or is disappearing or trying to peer into the future to figure out exactly what it is that's coming next, just like the disciples. What now? Remember what the disciples had just been through. Following Jesus, the Palm Sunday, Hosanna's Good Friday, when they thought it was all over, and then Easter, and it was not all over. But now, he's leaving again, just as he came back to them. And they wonder, what is going to happen to us without him? There are so many times of waiting, of transition in our lives, the wondering, what's going to be next in a life. Not just moving around physically like I did in my childhood. Sometimes there are happy events with transition periods. Young adults leave home to go to college or the military or to start work somewhere. A new baby is always a challenging transition and most usually, especially the first time. The last child leaves home, we retire. Sometimes transition events are not happy. We get laid off from work and feel helpless or useless. A marriage ends in divorce. Someone goes off to war. A loved one gets ill or dies. Physical illness strikes us with frailty, stroke, or disease, or just ordinary aging. The underlying questions for us will always be the same. What now? What will happen next? What's going to happen? To me, how will it be? Will my child, my husband, my friend be okay? Will I be okay? So these are normal reactions. These are regular reactions that everybody has. And it's okay to have those feelings and ask those questions. What's important is well, how we go about hearing and answering. Another lesson, third lesson from today's text, um, as in all of scripture, um, these questions actually get answered, but not in obvious ways. <laughs> so the disciples say, what next? What are you, what's going to happen? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know. <laughs> it's not for you to know what God's times and periods are. <laughs> we keep wanting definite answers. It's human. When? How? What? It's absolutely human nature. I do it all the time. We all do it. It's hard to let go of the notion that we have a right to know these things. It's hard to accept that it's not our business to know the future. What we are told by way of an answer is that we are not to keep standing around, gazing into the heavens, looking for the second coming, or looking for what was past, or looking for life after death, or even into the future of our own lives. Our business is to keep our eyes on the life we have now, in the place we are now. To be witnesses, as Jesus called his disciples, to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, in this end of the earth, 
in whatever ways we can do that. And then once we are willing to listen to what God says, willing to stop gazing into the past or um, trying to see into the future, we will be given what we need to do our business, to do that work, God's business, right here, right now. We will receive the Holy Spirit with power, as Paul says in that letter to the church at Ephesus. He, he speaks of the immeasurable greatness of power available to us and prays for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That is discernment to know the power we already have, to know the hope we already have, to know the glorious inheritance we have as children, beloved children of God. And we don't, so we don't have only, <laughs> every day we should thank God for this, we don't have only our own power to deal with those what now transitions. We have hope and trust that the same God who raised Jesus from the dead and raised him to rule over everything and everyone for all ages, that same God will empower us to rise into new lives. When I was a child and made all of those moves, I didn't know what would happen, but I trusted my parents and went where they took me, knowing that wherever we went, I would be cared for and protected in the new places, just as I had always been in the places we'd been before. What now moments can arise at whatever time of life we're in? We are, in fact, whether we think about it or, or articulate it, we're always in transition, always. It's rarely very dramatic and often not even noticeable at the time, but we are always in transition from our past to our future, from this life to new life in Christ, always becoming, always becoming something new and different. So we need to be conscious where God is taking us, where God can take us, if we trust God to lead us, we have work to do. We don't have time to be gazing up or gazing back at the way it used to be, or even very far forward. Look around at what needs to be done now and ask, how can we do this now? We can pray for each other and for all of God's world. We can forgive whoever has injured us, and we can be willing to be forgiven. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes we beat ourselves up way too long. We can help each other and strangers who are in need. We can always be kind to one another and to everyone who is hurting. We can show God's love to everyone we meet. That that is how we are lifted up to where Jesus has gone. We are lifted by doing the same work that he did and the work he has given to us now in this place, in this time. Let it be so. shall reign where air the sun. Please note that the, we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. Please stand as you are able. I've skipped a page. Sorry. This happens a lot. This middle page comes out and then I'm lost. <laughs> okay. Wrong. 388. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. We are only going to sing three verses, but a different three verses. <laughs> um, 388, oh Jesus, I have promised, verses one, two, and four. Thank you all. Thank you. 
today, which is an affirmation, responsive affirmation of Paul. Let us affirm what we believe. We believe in Jesus the Christ. Yet Easter has come and gone. The lilies have faded and fallen. The crowds have slipped away. We believe in the life of Jesus. Real life has crept into our worship, sharing losses with our friends saying goodbye to choirs for the season. We believe that Jesus was betrayed, he suffered and died. We begin to wonder if it really matters. Does our faith really affect our lives? Does God make a difference in the real world? We believe in the resurrection, that the suffering and even death are not the final word, that God can and will triumph. I just want to say about that glitch, <laughs> long hymn and everything. When we do the preparation, at the very beginning, we say that, you know, let's have a moment of silence, you know, gather our hearts for worship. Pretty much every week, what I am praying is, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> just want you to know. <laughs> um, we're going to actually, the, um, we, don't have the lengthy prayers of the people during the uh, great prayer uh, because of the great prayer of Thanksgiving with um, communion, but um, we would like to share joys and concerns at this time. Prayers for Tanya who will be having heart surgery this week. And the name was? Tom Dunn. Tom Dunn, heart surgery. <coughs> Prayers for our great nephew Beckham. Um, he's just uh, less than two. Uh, Prefaces that like things are going in the right direction. Came back from a beach vacation with sand in his eye. Went to the eye doctor, and not only was there sand, but there was cancer behind his left eye. Um, they're up in the Rochester area. They were looking at some of the specialists down in Philadelphia because someone had been trained and done a lot of work with the people in uh, Philadelphia. They opted to do chemotherapy up in Rochester. So this past week, um, the first procedure went really, really well. They said it was like flawless, and it was the first time
done, they've done it at the hospital up in Rochester. Wow. So he's got three months of uh, some chemotherapy for a tumor behind his left eye, but they were very optimistic and uh, pleased with how the first procedure went through, but less than two years old. But the whole thing was, they went to the eye doctor because of the sand in the eye. Whoever thought you'd be grateful for him, so, sand in the eye? Yeah, yeah. Joy, joy, yeah, really. joy and concern. Yeah, joy and concern. Very pleased. Then, as we are <coughs> invited every week to offer the gifts of our lives and, and the special gifts that we have been given, we are also uh, invited to return to God a portion of the material gifts that we have been given. <coughs> Thank you, you gracious, gracious God, God, for the, the new beginnings possible through the work of your Holy Spirit within us. Help our own spirits soar in gratitude for the gift of creation and of life. May our gifts reflect our readiness truly to see your Son and to respond to him in all that we do.
please follow along and join me uh, in the parts that are bolded in the service of the Lord's table. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, proclaimed to us a new commandment, love for one another. May God find us in that love and make us servants of each other. Let conflict be unknown among us, and let us forgive one another as Jesus forgave us. Let us seek God among those who are the neediest. Let us empty ourselves of all and empty from our pride, and become joyful servants of the poor and suffering. Left out of line, but you know it. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to our God. Let us give thanks to God, for God is good. Holy, 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 God of the power and energy, heaven and earth are full of your glory, O God, God is high. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, God of majesty and splendor. By your power you created all that is, making a universe out of chaos and ruling over all things in love. Throughout the ages, you called your people to love and serve you and to be your light among the nations. When we failed you, you did not fail us and sent prophets to call us back to your ways. We praise you that in the fullness of time, you revealed your love by sending your son, Jesus, to be the light of the world. He came to heal our brokenness and to set before us the ways of justice and peace. Baptized by John in the Jordan, he lived for you, spoke your truth, showed your love, and gave himself for others. In his death on the cross, he overcame death. Rising from the tomb, he raised us to eternal life and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Gracious God, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit make us one with Christ that we may be one with all who share this feast united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Illumine our hearts, O God, with the radiance of Christ's presence, that our lives may show forth his love in this weary world. Teach us to befriend the lost, to serve the poor, and to love both neighbors and enemies as you have loved us. Keep us faithful in your service, until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. If you've been here on one of the few occasions when I've been able to here for a first Sunday to serve communion, you will know that I have said before how much I love, I love the communion service <laughs> because it represents how loved and how forgiven and how accepted we are. Because as the words say, on the night, the very night that Jesus was betrayed by his best friends, his followers. On that very night, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper was over, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, covenant in my blood, which is poured out, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. 
Take this cup and drink it in remembrance of me. Every time we gather at this table and eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Christ's saving death until he comes again. And sisters and brothers, come again, he will. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Sisters and brothers, the body of Christ, the bread of life.
sisters and brother, this is the cup of salvation. Please join me in the unison prayer after communion printed in your bulletin. Holy God, we have feasted in memory of the night Jesus was betrayed, and in the confidence that we will feast again with him in glory. We give you thanks for the gift of this meal, shared among friends. We give you thanks for the gift of Jesus' life, his body broken for us. Give us grace to be the hungry in the name of the one who died and was raised from death, that the world might have life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. Now we will sing 423, <laughs> Jesus shall reign where the sun, and we will sing uh, verses 1, 3, and 4, 1, 3, and 4. join me in the response of benediction, you will notice that this is a mirror of our call to worship. So if it sounds sort of familiar, it should. <laughs> we leave this place of prayer to join God in listening to the hopes and dreams and the hidden fears and the doubts of our neighbors. We leave this place of grace to share the compassion and joy of Jesus with others so they will discover how deeply they are loved. We leave to be with the people of our world, so the Spirit might bless us with their rich gifts, so we may discover our oneness in God. <laughs> 